Let's say hi to everybody watching. Our topic today is inappropriate elimination in dogs and cats. And basically that means when your dog or your cat is pooping or peeing in places that they shouldn't. So if your dog uh, is making your living room their personal bathroom, or if your cat is leaving you stinky surprises outside of the litter box, then this is definitely the show for you. And don't worry, you're not alone. We're here to help today. If you are new here, I'm Kristen Levine. I'm the founder of the Pet Living Blog, where I help you make informed decisions about your pet's health and wellness. Today, I have a really special guest who is a veterinary behaviorist, and she's going to tell you what exactly that means. And she's going to help us understand why pets do this, why dogs and cats would make messes in other places than where they should, and also going to kind of dig into whether or not fear or anxiety or stress plays a role in those messy problems. So, all right, I'm going to let Tulip jump because it is her dinner time. <laughs> and I'm going to introduce my fabulous guest, Dr. Amy Pike. Welcome, Dr. Pike. Hi, thanks, Kristen, for having me. I do just want to tell our audience a little bit about your credentials. Um, you're a board-certified veterinary behaviorist. You are the owner of uh, Animal Behavior Wellness Center, which is in... Fairfax, and you have a Richmond location mm -hmm. too. And you are a former captain of the Army Veterinary Corps, which is really interesting. Maybe you could just tell us a little short snippet about that before we dive into our topic. Yeah, no. So um, I was a veterinarian for the military uh, when I first got out of veterinary school and took care of military working dogs and um, government horses and privately owned pets owned by military personnel. And well, let's just jump in uh, to, the, to the first question, which is this is a complicated topic. I know because I've seen you speak for hours about this. So <laughs> we're just going to be here for about 20 minutes today. But why is it that pets go to potty? where they shouldn't. Yeah, so there's a number of different reasons. And the first one that we always wanna make sure that we rule out is medical because there are many medical disorders that can cause your dog or cat to not want to use their normal, where you desire, potty spot. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you can have a urinary tract infection and if it, you know, you need to go potty more frequently, then you might not have access to the outside or mm -hmm. diabetes causes you to drink a lot of water. And so therefore you might need to pee a lot more. So there's just a lot of different uh, medical reasons. But then mm -hmm. once we've ruled out all those medical, there's a lot of behavioral reasons too. So including sort of the number one is fear, anxiety, and stress. So that is the number one. I, I didn't even realize that. Okay. Yep, absolutely. So that, I mean, cats and dogs, they, uh, when they are stressed, they do behaviors, perform behaviors that they wouldn't normally otherwise do. And oftentimes house soiling or urination or defecation outside the litter box is one of those. Mm. Are there other signs that go along with, I mean, obviously you would notice if your cat mm -hmm. is defecating outside the litter box. Yeah. Um, are there other signs that, that go along with this that would indicate whether it's a medical or a stress related problem? Sometimes no. So it can be hard for the owner to determine, you know, oh, all of a sudden my cat is, you know, peeing outside the litter box or my dog is, like you said, using your living room as a, mm -hmm. as its potty spot. And there may not be other signs of fear, anxiety, and stress, especially if, if owners are not necessarily keyed into body language, which is, is really important in, in terms of how we decide if our pets sure. are, are stressed, right? One very easy thing and, or sort of thing that they will see, obviously, is the house soiling. And mm -hmm. sometimes they don't notice other, other signs and symptoms. How common is this problem? Or how yeah. often do you see it in your practice? Yeah, so it's really common. Um, for cats, it's the number one reason that cats are seen by veterinary behaviorists. Um, it's actually also the number one reason cats are relinquished to shelters mm -hmm. still is inappropriate yeah. elimination. And then it's a lower percentage for my dog patients, but it's still mm -hmm. very common. Okay. We had some questions come in earlier today from our audience, and I thought we would we can go ahead and put one of those up. This one's from Dawn. She said, her dog doesn't mess on the floor, but messes in the bed. Whether mm -hmm. it's... It, Oh, this is interesting. Whether it's his own bed or hers, doesn't matter. Yeah. So the first thing that I would think of when I when I hear this is, you know, first of all, I'm going to assume the mess is urination. And so if it's urination, maybe the dog is actually leaking urine when they're sleeping. And it's actually mm. an incontinence issue versus a conscious, I'm choosing to pee 
on the bed. Um, so again, one reason why you want to go see your veterinarian first and foremost is to rule out all the medical things that it could be. And then I just told a client this earlier today is behavior sort of frustrating from the owners as well as my perspective, because it's very much sort of a rule out diagnosis, meaning you have to rule out everything else that could be happening. And then you get backed into this like, well, I guess it's behavioral corner. And then we dive down that rabbit hole of treatment. And, and another side effect of inappropriate elimination is it, it does tend to erode the human animal bond. Absolutely. Doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I will say my husband's line in the sand is if the cat ever poops or pees outside the litter box. So I tell her every single day she better continue with her good potty habits because that's the line. So you're yeah, right. well, yeah, I'm sure it causes absolutely. a lot, not only a lot of just human stress, but uh, marital stress too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, and, and, you know, there are some people that are, are quite tolerant of some things and I and I think more so in cats than in dogs but pooping and peeing in your home when you would prefer it elsewhere um, definitely one of those difficult things for owners yeah and, and I think it's also important to address and I, and I think we have a, had a question um, along these lines come in today that I've heard people suggest that their pet is doing this to get back at them they're angry oh, at them or yeah, something like that tight. so yeah this, mm -hmm. this is the one Jen she, yeah. she said when her um, if her dog's mad, she will accurately, she says, drop one on your foot with precise <laughs> precision. Wow. Um, where she knows uh, yeah. when you get up where you're going to go. And she, yeah. So what do you say about that? kind of Yeah. Thing? So we don't think that dogs and cats actually have that capability of spite. And so that is very much a human anthropomorphic emotion. And mm -hmm. so maybe, um, you know, it just happens to be in this line of, you know, this pathway that your dog also takes you know, mm -hmm. and so they're, they're happy to poop or pee right there. The dropping one on your foot with precise precision, a little bit different. And I also think that that would be something that I would be worried about medical too, because mm -hmm. if your pet is right there pooping in front of you onto your foot, that very rarely do, do dogs, number one, they don't mark with defecation. Dogs don't. Um, yeah. So it's not like they're marking you, but again, it's that whole, your dog's not spiteful. So right. maybe they are panicked. I hear this a lot with my uh, patients with separation anxiety, the owners go, oh, they were mad at me because I left them home alone. Well, no, mm -hmm. they were panicked. They weren't angry. And so, okay, so that's an example. Separation anxiety is a good example mm -hmm. of, you know, they're panicked because you've mm -hmm. left, but what other mm -hmm stressors or fears could lead to to this problem yeah so i've seen dogs poop and pee um, in the house when thunderstorms are happening mm -hmm. so because again it's that whole panic response if they have aggression with other like inner cat or sorry inner dog mm -hmm. conflict and inner cat conflict happens too mm -hmm. but I mean, we can talk about that one but inner dog let's say one dog blocks access to the backyard well the dog that's access this block says, well, I don't want to go in the backyard because I'm going to get attacked. And so mm. I still have to go. So where else am I going right. to go but in the house, right? And and this is, I would say, probably one of the most common reasons for um, cats that inappropriate eliminate is uh, inner cat conflict. And okay. so cats will block other cats from using the litter box resources. Mm. And, and it's very subtle. It's not like a, mm. I'm going to fight you to the death at the, you know, the entrance to the box, but but they may right. just lay across the door, you know, and not allow another cat to access that box. They may ambush a cat that's in the box and then scare that cat. And yeah. so therefore that cat doesn't want to use that box anymore in the future too. And that's why we always hear that it's very important that if you have multiple cats that you have at least a box for each mm -hmm. cat plus one, right? Yeah, plus. And I would say that probably underestimates how many boxes mm -hmm. you sh really should have, especially in multi-story houses. Oh, you that's... know, if you if you live in an apartment and you have two cats, you should you should yes have three boxes. But if you mm -hmm. live in a three-floor house, you should have at least multiple boxes per level. Okay, that's a lot of boxes. But... It's a lot of boxes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So is this something that can be cured or is it something we, is it just something we, we learn to manage or? Cure is not a word that we use in behavior very often. <laughs> unfortunately. So, uh, unfortunately, yeah. So behavior, I kind of think is like very similar to dermatological diseases or mm -hmm. even cancer. Very rarely do we ever cure those disorders like diabetes. We're always going to manage it. We're always going to have to give medications potentially, but very rarely do we ever or ever 
cure something. There's always going to be ebbs and flows, but there are a lot of things that we can do for this disorder to include just environmental management, you know, improving litter box hygiene for kitty cats and, you know, increasing territory for our cats and, and then treatment of fear, anxiety, and stress. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like in, in terms of, are we talking about medication or are we talking about supplements, pheromones, or a combination yep. of all could of those be, things? Could be all of the above. It's, yeah. And it's going to certainly depend on what the each patient um, is very different. And it could be pheromones, mm -hmm. it could be nutraceutical supplements, diet changes, or medication. We use all of the mm -hmm. same psychotropic medication that they do in people nowadays in our veterinary patients. And, we, and so we've got lots of options. What about dogs? What are some of the environmental modifications you might make in a situation where you have, whether it's one or multiple dogs? Is it more common? In, is it, It's inappropriate elimination in dogs more common if there are multiple dogs? Not necessarily. Dogs okay. No, not necessarily. Okay. So like if, if we're talking about a case of, let's say, separation anxiety, we're obviously going to be treating the underlying disorder, the panic disorder, and, and mm -hmm. teaching that animal to be home alone, that they don't need to panic. Um, and most often that is going to be a combination of training, which we call behavior modification yeah. and medication as well. So again, it just sort of all depends on what the underlying root cause of this is. Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong, if I get this mm -hmm. wrong, but I remember you talking about how often medical problems are kind of they come with behavioral problems. So it's not always either or, right? Yeah. You, and, you know, I, I saw this in general practice too. It's like you might treat the medical issue, like the urinary tract infection in the kitty cat, and then the behavior remains. And, and oftentimes that's because there is a negative emotional response. If the cat goes to the litter box and it hurts to pee, mm -hmm. okay they're going to go somewhere else potentially, right? While you treat the infection as the veterinarian, infection goes away, it's cleared up. But the last time the cat used the box, it hurt. So they're not going to want to yeah. do that anymore. So so sometimes it's, we have to treat both arms of the uh, disorder. Terrific. Let's put up our, our uh, that third question that we had um, sent in earlier today. Uh, this is from mm -hmm. Ash. <laughs> don't mess at home but one of my cats did at the vet oh okay while while being examined is that yeah. was that a fear issue perhaps that was absolutely a fear issue so mm -hmm. um your cat was probably very very nervous and then pooped or peed to show how nervous they are and there's a lot of things that we can do to help patients like that that experience fear and stress at the vet clinic as well yeah, and that's really what, that's what fear free is all about, isn't yeah. it? You can find a fear free veterinary professional or practice near you, and one that's been specially trained to help reduce the anxiety in pets visiting the vet, right? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So, in terms of where you can find fear free vets, they are much more in number than than veterinary behaviorists, and many of them are very comfortable treating behavior not to the level of a veterinary behaviorist, obviously, mm -hmm. but they're much more comfortable with these medications, and especially when pets are experiencing fear at the vet's office, that's really where they excel. Right. Let's put up the Fear Free website. Um, you can go to fearfreepets.com and they also have a search function if you'd like to look for a fear free practice in your area. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Pike, this um, we just relocated from Florida to a very small town in North Carolina. There's only nine, the population is 9,000 people here. Oh, wow. And so, of course, you know, I didn't expect to find a fear free practice, but wouldn't you know it? There's one eight miles from me. So That's wonderful. <laughs> I, I, love I, I love that. I love that. That's yeah. awesome. In closing, what advice would you give to a dog or cat mom who um, maybe noticed that this has just started happening with the cat peeing outside the box or pooping outside the box, same for a dog? What, what would be the first thing that you would recommend that they do? Absolutely go see your veterinarian because any new behavior almost 100% across the board is medical. Behaviors don't just crop up suddenly without some sort of either trauma event um, or a medical underpinning. And so go see your vet and make sure that we're really not everything. And then if, you know, we've treated the medical or haven't found any medical, then, you know, go seek care from a veterinary behaviorist. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, if you let these things go too long, they, they mm -hmm. are more difficult to manage, aren't they? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's much easier to treat a cat that's been doing this for seven days versus seven years. Yeah. I think I heard you tell that story about... <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, yes. Yes. The, Do you want me to tell it? <laughs> yes. Could you please? It was, yeah. it was yeah. funny, not funny. Funny, and, not and, funny. And yeah. Alyssa, Alyssa put up uh, Dr. Pike's uh, hospital web website. Yeah. Uh, so... When I was in residency, I had a um, an owner present to me with a cat who had been peeing outside the litter box for 17 years, and and I sort of had this 
I, I don't know, dumbfounded look probably on my face and like, why are you coming to see me now? And she was getting carpet, new carpet. Next oh, week. yeah. And unfortunately, um, unfortunately for her and unfortunately for the kitty cat, um, I'm not going to be able to treat 17 years of behavior in one week. And, um, you know, she did make the real tough decision to to um, euthanize her cat. But, mm-hmm. you know, and like I said, I would rather see a cat that's been peeing outside the litter box for 17 days. I much have, have much higher <laughs> success rate with that than yeah. something that's going on for that long. Yes, don't challenge Dr. Pike with it. No, with oh, like no. That, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> I don't want to be a last resort. (laughs) Okay. Well, Dr. Pike, I so appreciate you joining us today. And I also really appreciate your contributions to um, our pets' emotional health and behavior. Um, So glad that it's getting more and more attention these days and more pet parents are learning about veterinary behavior. So thank you again. You as well. Take care. Okay. (laughs) 